Right, hey guys, how are we doing? Back in another video from Totally Not Mark. We are on the second review for the Yu Yu Hacker Show. Uh, I've been watching the anime. Mark's review is based off the manga, so I, I like to see the differences. There was quite a few differences in the first part, like a lot was cut out of the, uh, the anime uh, that was in the manga. And interestingly enough as well, as I was watching season two of um, Yu Hacker Show, the, the Dark Tournament, I noticed quite a few um, moments that have been referenced or used in other stuff. Like uh, I think someone mentioned that uh, in Jujutsu Kaisen, they're, they're influenced by the Yu Hacker Show. And I noticed little moments like uh, spoilers for JJK, but when what happens, well, whatever happens to Nanami, when he looks at Yuji, he says, you've got this. It reminded me of a moment with Kuwabara within this. And then there was a couple of other moments. And I was like, that's pretty, pretty interesting. And my favorite character now, after this, was it, it is Kuwabara. Like, he is the man. Kuwabara is the dude. And uh, Togoro was a very, very interesting um, bad guy. Especially when you start learning about his relationship with Bar-san. I can't remember. I'm, I'm terrible with names. But, um... Yeah, uh, everyone had a really cool moments. A lot of fun. Let's get into it. Man, it's been a while since the mangas made me feel this excited. Cool. Yu Yu Hakusho is the story of a legendary artist finding their voice and honing their craft, not across decades, but months. Okay. It has been one of the most fascinating reads I've covered on this channel so far, not so much because of its story initially, but because it has essentially taken me on a meta journey through an author's transition from a romantic comedy writer to a fully fledged master of battle shonen. All right, he was a romantic comedy writer first. From yeah. his art style to the way he weaves drama through combat, Yoshihiro Togashi has evolved chapter after chapter. And upon hitting the prelude to the subject of this very video, Yu Yu Hakusho was already feeling like a completely different series. The jump in quality was palpable. But now, heading right into the midst of a story arc I hear is widely considered the, the very best in the genre, I could not be more excited to explore for the very first time the mysterious, brutal, and captivating Dark Tournament arc. Let's do it. <laughs> This girl. You win. This is cool. Yeah. The end of the prelude to this very story Let's left us on one hell of a cliffhanger. Forced into competing in a terrifying tournament by the monstrous Togoro, Yusuke zoomed off to Genkai's place with pure determination Genkai. to get stronger. And me, in all of my manga-loving wisdom, thought, I'm sick, training arc time. But Togashi said, eh, no. And jumped right into the start of this tournament. <laughs> well, this off isn't the first time Togashi's done this throughout this story, but I think it actually works remarkably well here. This tournament is essentially thrown into characters, and by extension, me, the reader, into totally uncharted territory. Togoro's insanely strong, but what about yeah. the other contestants? And with only the tiniest glimpse into what Yusuke and his team have achieved over the past two months, it leaves every moment of these early fights shrouded in uncertainty. Considering these are fights to the death, well, that sure does amp up the tension to a whole other level. It does, and... They're such interesting fights with such interesting abilities and that like it's ah and I've watched well I'll I'll leave it I'll leave it because I feel like Jujutsu Kaisen's taken something from the next arc as well I've started watching a couple episodes of that but yeah yeah. In many ways, this almost feels like a sort of reset. Emerging from the kind forest of, with yeah. a mysterious partner, Yusuke feels so. I don't know, different to the punk kid that defines so much of the prior material. Here he stands amidst a veritable army of demon onlookers and he's just Cam. After a brief Cam. test of I love the way he says Cam. Of skills from Hiei, the gang hop onto a ship to take them to the tournament, but quickly they're faced with a surprise battle royale preliminary fight. Boy, does this feel familiar. Except yeah. one thing. I love that he's just sleep. He's far too tired from all the training. <laughs> the purpose of all this mystique is actually quite clever. You see, had we seen the training our participants underwent to get here, as many manga would have chosen to do, by this stage we would be deeply familiar with our team's capabilities and all the excitement would fall on their opponent's inability to make good on that training. 
However, now even her heroes act as a point of excitement and anticipation for us, in addition to whoever they may face. Much like Goku showing up to the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai after his mysterious training, only for us to turn each page with bated breath as he demonstrates just how far he's come, so too do we feel that with every single character on I think it's a better way of telling a story. Taking that even further, Togashi ups the uncertainty by including a masked participant, one who seems pretty clearly to be Genkai, though that is quickly ruled out by Kuwabara and Ko suspecting the very same. It's all just very mysterious, and though I am still not 100% convinced the mass fighter isn't Genkai, all I'm really left to do is strap on my metaphorical They do throw it off a bit, out. don't they? Like, they do throw the sense off. Nani? How do you get in the room? <laughs> Uncertainty might as well be Togashi's middle name at this point, because he sure ain't letting up with the rising tension here. As the gang relax in their hotel room, they're snuck up on by two members of the team they'll soon face in their first match, Rinku and Zeru. While narratively, this scene exists to relay some tournament rules and intimidate Yusuke's team, what it's doing under the hood is what I find to be the most fascinating. On one level, it's indicating the level of skill in play here is beyond anything the gang have seen before. I mean, nobody noticed them sneak in. Yeah, it, it kind of sets the level down, but then this also shows well, like as it goes on, everyone gets a heck of a lot stronger throughout. Like That's some creepy stuff right off the bat, but on the other hand, it's helping to build up this new Yusuke. He doesn't even stir from his sleep, leaving Zeru to essentially speak for the reader, quote, did he sense we didn't intend to attack, or, and that's it, hmm. or. That single word ensured that I was locked in for at least a hundred more pages, and I'm not kidding. Does he just not even consider their power a threat? Just how much has Yusuke improved yeah, what's, here? What's on going on? <laughs> everything else built up across these early pages, that alone is a thrilling question to have linger as we head into the very first match. Oh, she's great. She's greater than the other woman that comes in as well for the second part of it. Oh, my God. When I first saw that a single tournament was going to span 60 chapters, on one hand, part of me worried that it would get stale after. It was a lot of episodes as well, wasn't it? But I was a bit like, how do you do this for so long? But it's just, yeah, it was dead interesting. Well, but on the other hand, I was well aware of the tournament's positive reputation and wondered how on earth Togashi was going to pull this off. Is it going to evolve into a grander story or is it going to be another situation where my experience doesn't quite map onto the wider fandoms. Well, I don't actually know. I write this as I read it, but yeah. what Togashi does do is establish a mechanic I've never seen in a tournament setting before, and one that offers endless possibilities to keep things fresh. The team captains must agree on what constitutes a battle and what counts as a win. Ooh, if they can't agree yeah. on something, then each member fights one-on-one, -on -one, effectively meaning no matter what the narrative demands, these battles can facilitate it. It's utterly genius, and what a spectacularly creative choice, and one that immediately doused my fears of the story ever feeling repetitive. And with the first matchup agreeing to a standard one-on-one -on -one bout, it's time to jump into battle. Well, this is what I'm trying to remember this because like it's been over like the last couple of weeks. I've been watching this. This is the beginning. It's cool, but our, uh, it made it look like he was just absolute trout, like. Just beating up on the guy, didn't he? Team and then Urameshi versus Team Roku Yukai. Yeah. In other stories I've read that like, fall Ooh. within the battle shown in genre, one aspect that I look out for as the calling card of quality is the author's ability to interweave the story into the battles that take With place. The yeah, yeah, yeah. In the right hands, combat is very much the language of it Battle Shonen. The, the and only the it. best do it right. And right out the gate, Togashi wastes no time in declaring that he's no average mangaka. As I've mentioned, the ability to define the terms of battle affords each team's outing the chance to take whatever shape is best suited to whatever story Togashi is aiming to tell. And while I intend to talk about all of my favorite fights individually, I don't intend on covering the minutia of every single battle because, Makes well, sense. there's a lot. There's a lot of there them. is a lot. There is a lot of fights. It's a For lot instance, of fights. this team battle, despite amounting to four separate matchups, really acts to establish the setting, the loose rules in play, and most importantly, to test just how far our heroes have come against foes that have already been established as formidable. In other words. This team battle is sort of Togashi's proof of concept for what will eventually, more or less, become the conclusion to this story. And it's delicious. 
Like I said, two of these team members sneak up on our heroes the night before. Hmm, two enemies, one tall and another short, intimidating our heroes? Where have I seen that before? While the best battle of this early matchup is undoubtedly its climax, these early battles are nothing to scoff at either. Kubara steps up as the first combatant, putting himself at an immediate disadvantage against ah, one of the Kubar only two main so fighters on the opposing team. And what's more is, he loses. Yeah. But what's masterful about this first outing isn't the result necessarily, but what the result communicates to us as readers and viewers. While Kuwabara did lose, it was a close match, and one that stood to convey both to his opponents, as well as us readers at home, that Team Urameshi is not quite as hopelessly outmatched as they may seem. Mm, yeah. Continuing this chaos, and to further establish Team Urameshi, we see the Kurama. Honorable Kurama face off against the Dishonorable Roto. Yeah, he's the guy with the knife thing, and oh, he's weird. Doesn't he threaten to kill his Emphasizing Earth the sort of low mom. lives we stand to face in this tournament and the lengths they'll go to in order to secure the win. Even in a fight this seemingly unimportant, Togashi performs a narrative sleight of hand by setting up the expectation of Kurama as the honorable fighter, only to completely subvert that as he With whips out scary that. plant no jutsu, yes. pretty gnarly stuff, and equally importantly, tells us yet more about how far these heroes have come. Yo, oh, yay. <laughs> the way he goes as well and progresses with his technique and then like when he just was it the bit where his arm is all beat up and Kurobar uh, is like what are you doing? He's like, I just wasn't doing what I wanted it to do so I just kept beating it up. It's like, oh, okay. Jesus. In the spirit of keeping every fight feeling distinct, Hiei's bout is as short as it is cathartic. That is to say, very. I'll be the first to admit it here, I got off to a rough start with Hiei. As a character, I thought his first outing in the series was exceptionally weak compared to literally everything else that came yeah, out. Yeah, it seemed very... But it seems, in addition mm, to this tournament being a sort of... But everyone gets their moments in this. Everyone. Reset for Yusuke and the world around him. It also acts as a sort of reintroduction and reinvention of Hiei into a more traditional powerhouse type character for the team. And it offers an interesting dynamic to spruce things up following the competitive and tense Kurama bout. What began as two mysterious individuals intimidating the hero team has now met a total role reversal. He a, is a terrifyingly powerful ally. Yes, he is. And with this little beloved Chaos Gremlins victory, there are only two more members left of the enemy team. No, there's oh. that. Yep. I guess I got ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> drunk guy. Yusuke versus Chu. Togashi sure as hell isn't hesitant in reminding us that this isn't your typical shonen battle tournament. There's a lot more room for, let's say, improvisation, which turns an already exciting contest into a thrilling spectacle. And if there were ever a contestant to throw things off kilter, it's this guy. Oh, this is the bit where he puts the knife on the floor, isn't it? And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Chu. Chu is a drunken master, a real brute, and enough of a threat to finally wake our hero up. Let's go. Oh yeah, okay, here we go. Yusuke's up and in spite of Chu's menacing presence, he claims this is going to be light work. <laughs> you could already cut this tension with a knife, but what's so fascinating <laughs> is the way Togashi mean. uses the prior fights to build this one up further. Mortal Kombat It's not exactly background. uncommon in battle manga to have earlier fights appear easier, only for the final big bad to appear and surpass their strength. Heck, Kuwabara even addresses this, stating that things have basically been a joke up until now. But I love that Kurama steps in to subvert that very notion. Zeru, according to him, was a genuine threat. Hihei literally had to fall back on an imperfect technique that we now know cost him the full use of his yeah. arm. But in spite of all of this, we're told that Chu is somehow even worse. And that certainly doesn't take long to find out either, as Chu catches Yusuke off guard from the get-go. But what really stood out to me about this section is Togashi's artwork. I've noticed- Yo, that looks amazing! Holy what? The anime had an upgrade as well, to be fair. The improvements to his writing so far, but it still cannot Yo. be understated just how much of a jump Togashi's so good. Has seen in tandem. If we jump back only a few volumes, 
you'll find rigid battles with stubbier characters and Fair fairly enough, standard okay. line work. Just Which, off don't get me wrong, looks fine, but doesn't exactly have a dramatic edge to it. It feels in line with the type of lighthearted work Togashi had been writing prior to Previously, this. Previously, right. But with the prelude to this very arc, his work changed dramatically. Yusuke got taller, his hair got messier. It really started to look like a battle manga now. And as the dramatic battle begins with Chu, Togashi's training weights are fully off and the master that blew my mind with the stunning Hunter Hunter art is finally starting to emerge. The loose line work, the fluid gesture, not only did it fit the description of Chu's gliding moves, but it feels, I don't know, huge. The impacts yeah. dance off the, the page and the ink brush that define wow, Hunter Hunter so Hunter is sick. starting to make an appearance now. The stuff is incredible and I'm so glad the writing of this fight matches it. Not only did Yusuke block Chu's devastating kick with one arm, he walks that bitch off, fires yeah, a ray gun into the air just to show off his move, and then say he's only got three of his daily four limit left. What a baller! Yusuke is now dead, behold, Chadsuke. I love that Togashi just <laughs> won't stop playing with expectations also in this fight. First, Yusuke's overwhelmed, then he's fine, then he's showing off his power, and then... Just to flip the battle on its head, Chu just laughs and powers up even further, conjuring a goddamn energy ball to rival Yusuke's Raygun. The ensuing clash. And I like this because doesn't it go through it? Yeah, instead of it being the a yeah, this is so unbelievably so cool. good, and yet it ends in a total stalemate. Yeah, and this was real interesting. Like I said, they throw in some interesting things to do in these fights. Knife and chat match. I read the meme in Spanish. said you could cut the tension of this fight with a knife, and it's like Togashi heard me. The oh. rule of being able to decide what constitutes oh, yeah, the win knife was behind you in it, first person to actually like. Yeah, and it yeah. didn't take long for that mechanic to come Yo, into play. Yeah. Chu whips out two knives, driving them into the ground to mark the zones, and says that not only will the person who falls out of this <sighs> lose, but they'll pay with their life. And best of all, with everyone's reiki spent, this will be a battle of pure physical strength. I love this for so many wow, reasons. Wow, the edit on that was freaking boss. I'm always a sucker for fights that fall down to mutual respect between battle-obsessed warriors, but to flip the script on the dynamic of the battle oh. midway through is such a sick idea. Yeah. It keeps things fresh, and to impose physical limitations like this just opens the doors for so many fascinating twists and turns. This battle explodes off the page. In spite of the lack of Reiki, it feels bigger than anything we've seen mm. before. It is beyond So brutal. explosive. Blood spurts from their heels against the knives with every crushing blow, culminating in the most yeah, insane that headbutt. That is it's sick. like time stops and everyone looks on unsure before Chu slumps to the floor, defeated. Covered in blood and bruises, Yusuke turns to Rinku and says, our main character, everyone, that genuinely is just straight up one of the best battles I've consumed in quite some time. Yeah. It is such a spectacular reintroduction to this new version of Yusuke, and with this being only the climax of the first battle, it is so clear to me that not only am I in for a good time in this arc, mm. but Togashi has completely emerged from his cocoon as a master of battle shonen. I mean, I the purpose of the first, first team's battle round. was to establish the culture, rules, and atmosphere of this tournament itself. But this final fight was all of that in microcosm. A clash for the ages and one of the best fights I've ever seen. But again, that's not going to be the last time I'll say that in this video. No. Team Urameshi versus Team Ichigaki. Which team With the first hurdle this? out of the way, that brings us to day two of the tournament where Togashi introduces us to Team Ichigaki, who appears to be a head or two more barbaric than the uh, last batch. Right, yeah. But given their introduction is the most... Oh, yes, yeah, the weird one. They're all controlled by the weird harp thingy pump thingies. Yeah. Savage yet, showcasing the most brutal dismemberment, I figured we needed some levity in the room. But yes, these are the folks Team Urameshi are up against next, and things are not looking good here. 
Yusuke can't summon any aura after rapid firing his ray gun last round. Hiei's arm is beyond messed up and they've just gotten the news that they'll be up against Team Togoro if they progress any further. But it gets even worse with Kurama and Hiei being ambushed or leaving the team with only three members. I figured after the setup of this team's brutality and Team Urameshi put on the back foot that Togashi was sort of gearing up for a sense of desperation and that would be the- Oh yeah, they're away, aren't they? And then uh having to fight that big machine thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. ensuring this next battle felt different from the prior, but I honestly could not have been more wrong, in fact. The emphasis of this section is hardly on the action itself. Heck, it's hardly on Team Urameshi at all. Kuwabara has a dream about a group of martial arts students lamenting their inability mm -hmm. to pay for their sick master's treatment, only for someone called Ichigaki to roll up and offer to save him if they'll agree to take part in one of his experiments. Throughout these chapters, both Kurama and the Mass Fighter note that these opponents are definitely not here of their own volition. Yeah, I guess a bit sad as well, where they were all like, just kill us, please kill us. It's like, ugh. And so this three on three battle royale is no longer black and white. I adore that from a narrative point of view. The change in format was interesting enough, but to throw a moral conundrum into a death match is amazing. And their techniques were interesting as well, because doesn't Yusuke slowly as the fight goes on start to be able to see and perceive their actual attacks though. Ichigaki is a real bastard and so it yep. really becomes less about the two teams facing each other and more about them as a collective versus this monstrous scientist and trying to figure a way out of this horrible situation. Now don't get me wrong, the battle itself is still full of some great team up moments and Togashi even throws a spanner into the works when the masked fighter's shroud falls off revealing not Genkai yeah. but a young girl? Yeah, it was like, what? But then I like how it makes sense later, but it was like, what? What? <laughs> to me, it's learning about this team and how to get out of this situation what? that gave this segment of the tournament so much strength. After escaping their ambush, Hiei and Kurama literally drop into the arena and reveal the heinous crimes committed. Ichigaki caused their master to fall ill in the first place, and all in the name of creating that chance to perform this sick experiment. The mad scientist goes on further to reveal they're all infested with blood control nodes and... okay. I almost groaned thinking that this was one of those cases where the idiot monologuing villain was going to give away their key to victory. Yeah. But thankfully, Togashi's a bit better than that. And it turns out these things are permanent. You remove them and the host will die. And man, does the story get bleak from here on in. These poor martial artists cry out for death. Yeah, they're crying blood. They're literally crying blood yeah. from sheer desperation. Like, and in response to this, Yusuke's rage knows no bounds as he accepts he will have to no doubt put these people down and out of their misery until... <laughs> the masked fighter steps in without hesitation. Oh, yeah, to she does the... Yeah! Takes her hand into the hearts of the three opponents, <laughs> casting Purify. And, well, I think it's probably clear where this is going. There's a death fake out for the three, and Team Urameshi wins the fight. I was initially a little thrown off by how neatly this seemed to be tied up. Hiei and Kurama reveal they've found and cured the mentor. Yusuke obliterates the mad scientist, and hey, the three students are even alive. I was all prepared to criticize how convenient it all felt, and I suppose it still is to a certain extent, but I think the way it's conveyed stops it feeling cheap. The masked fighter reveals that what she did wasn't some miracle cure. It was a move that judges the host soul, soul and yeah. if that soul is pure, any corruptions are purified. The three were only saved because they are, at their good core, heart, yeah. good people. Yeah. With the sensei proclaiming pride in their incorruptible hearts, I just kind of got swept up in the poignancy of it's it all. Nice idea, Corruptible yeah. power is such a key theme of this arc, and to see such a positive resolution here was genuinely moving. I might not necessarily adore the way the pieces of this fight's resolution are put together, but when its emotional weight and development of the tournament's key themes are front and center like this, it's very easy to overlook any flaws. The quarterfinals, Shadow Channelers versus Team Urameshi. Yeah, if uh, if you thought that transition felt sudden, then you'd be right. God, these guys are crazy. Right, the next fight starts right away, no breaks, and I really like how the narrative is taking every opportunity to make Team Urameshi's presence in this tournament feel completely stifling. They came into this as underdogs, and things sure take a turn for the worse here as the odds continue to be stacked against them. As Yusuke puts it, 
This tournament is just a grinder, and they're the meat. The Shadow Chandlers are the most aesthetically consistent and mysterious so far, a disguise for a series of ninja demons that Kurama explains live exclusively He's for the carnage. Paint guys, Nothing man. like bloodthirsty ninjas to up the ante. And to make matters worse, with Kuwabara down for the count last round and the rest Kuwabara. of the team drained of energy, Team <clears throat> Urameshi isn't just the fish-out-of-water team, they are completely outgunned. With only three members battle ready, Togashi's created a sense of well-earned tension, leaving me to wonder, how on earth are they going to get out of this one? Much like the last round, it's not so much the super entertaining battles that sit at the forefront of the narrative here, but instead it's what this matchup tells us about the tournament. In spite of everything against them, things are only getting worse. Genkai and Hiei are lured off to some medical tent to check their wounds, only to find themselves trapped. Oh there. yeah, they get trapped in the bloody thing, and then she's like, Nearly there are close and that. Deemed medically Lovely. Unfit to <laughs> and with Kuwabara out of action, this leaves only Yusuke and Kurama in a fit state to fight in this horrifically biased matchup. Mercifully, the format agreed upon is a series of one-on-one -on -one battles. A true battle of attrition, and boy, does it deliver in every sense of the word. Kurama steps up, assuring Yusuke he'll get them to reveal their strategies while the rest may very well fall on him. Kurama's first opponent is a brush wielder named Gama, a body paint bearer whose ink, made from his own blood by the way, imparts curses upon those he marks. It is a brutal battle, one that pushes Kurama to the edge, and yet, despite winning, the markings left upon him keep his aura sealed yeah. for 10 minutes after Gama's death. I am not kidding when I say this entire segment had me feeling like, Jesus, I hope Kurama can avoid dying long enough to get some points on the board here. Each battle just feels like the disadvantages continue to pile up for this poor guy. Up until now, I had enjoyed this character, but my emotional investment in him during this early tournament wasn't super in-depth just yet. But wow, does that change here. The next opponent is an ice demon called Toya, the top rank of those seen so far. He is fiendishly smart and opts to fully take advantage of Kurama's sealed away energy. I love the character design as well with the hair and that like it's pretty freaking cool. Instead attacking exclusively from afar. I love the contrast between Toya battling the time limit of the ceiling mark and Kurama faced with enduring it. It is genuinely tense and man the way Kurama wins this is so big brain. <laughs> Toya jumps in close for the finishing blow, only for Kurama to impale him out of goddamn nowhere. Turns out this sly fox infected his open wounds with his deadly vest his to own, take the like, win. Seeds, yeah. I mean, you can't keep the aura in if it's bleeding out, so it all adds up. The absolute noggin on this lad. And if it he's No, he's a very, very clever guy. Kurama's very, very smart. Like, uh... I don't really want to talk about what I've seen in the next part yet, but, like, the, there is a moment where Kurama has his wits about him and proves he's the smartest. If anything is apparent in this match is that Togashi really just revels in the suffering of it all. This should be, by right, the end of the fight. And yet... <laughs> if there were ever a way to make me fall in love with a character, it's through these last stand moments. The sheer corruption running through this matchup is such a fascinating way of making it feel distinct from the other one-on-ones in the tournament thus far, and it really says a lot about how carefully Togashi considered each of these bouts, and most importantly... Jesus Christ, the animation on her, well, the, the, the detail on her face was like, wow! The character work within them, and that could not be more true than right here. <laughs> This is how you bring a character back into play. Yo. Marrying Kurama's dire circumstances and Yusuke's personality into a bombastic interjection that shifts things up a gear. This is Yusuke. No matter the consequences, no matter what those in charge say, Yusuke will stand by and do the right Heck thing, yeah, especially for his allies. Ah. This one shot of him silently aiming down Bakuken from the sidelines, all the while his teammate describes what's about to happen to him if he doesn't release Kurama, is seriously effective. With Yusuke taken to the stage, Togashi breaks the fourth wall as our hero utters, I'll wrap this up in ha! a two-page spread. Oh, that's boss. That's so cool. Ah, oh, I can obviously you can't have stuff like that. Oh. Where's the chat's gaming? Where's the chat? There he is. There's my guy. 
The next fight against Jin is pure cinema. I mean, this dude is basically just a goofy Goku type who's very enjoyable. Enjoying the very film. enjoyable. It's fun. a great bit of spectacle and some much needed levity after the intensity of Kurama's struggles. It results in a seemingly convincing win, leaving only one fight for the Shadow Channelers left, that being Risho. Fortunately for us, and unfortunately for our heroes, the way Togashi masterfully orchestrates the level of tension throughout this bout is crazy precise. This should carry with it the momentum forward of the tides turning in favor of Team Urameshi, but it doesn't. Under instructions from the higher-ups, Risho puts forth the case that Yusuke's victory should be disqualified on account of a slow count performed by the referee oh, yeah. in the prior conflict. And given where this idea came from in the first place, those very powers that be naturally agree that this is the case. And just like that, it's over. What a slimy way to win. Kuwabara, let's go! <laughs> I love this. Like, I am not out of this game yet. Okay, okay. I wish I could tell you how goddamn ecstatic Whoa! this thing is. It literally caught me so off guard, filled me with so much adrenaline. And he should that I damn near win. Hired a he should not win. He is so done. He's personal address, so I could personally massage his aching back in thanks. This moment made me more hyped than just about any page of any manga I've ever read. And I am not just saying that. It's moments like this that remind me why I love the medium of manga so much. This act tells you everything you need to know about Kuwabara and why he's my new favorite character hey, in this. Hey, doesn't the power of love get him to win this one as well? Like, doesn't the girl turn up and he's like, I love how he always high pitch voices Story. it. Like Definitively, that. Oh. there's no others. Being the strongest is cool. Being the best designed is cool. And being kind is underrated. But seeing the weakest character on the team fearlessly step up to the plate when no one else can, all in the name of saving lives, knowing he's marching towards almost certain death himself, <coughs> is one of the most powerful moments Excuse this me. series has conjured so far. Few stories can pull this off as effectively as this can. Thousands of people have claimed over the years that this is the best tournament arc in the medium. And as I read this, I'm finding it increasingly He's trying hard just to, to stand. That point. This is phenomenal and earns just walking over. He's like, ah! Conceivable <laughs> respect. And in addition to all of that, in the heat of this courageous moment, Kuwabara utters perhaps my favorite line in this entire manga. I'd love to bust this place open myself. But can't we show these cheating scumbags, even at our worst, we're better? Wow. Maybe it's because I'm a sap. Maybe it's the climate we live in these days. But those words Kuwabara uttered to Yusuke legitimately made me emotional while I was reading. During these matchups, the most prejudiced and crooked set of encounters, Kuwabara chooses to be better. In a world where we glorify an eye for an eye as long as it aligns with our own ideologies, this sentiment was one that hit me right in the feels when I needed it the most. We need to celebrate more heroes like this. It should go without saying that this stunning moment results in a victory for Team Urameshi. How could it not? And yet the moment is one of perfect comedy. A brutal one-hit KO upon Kurabara noticing Yukine has arrived in the arena. <laughs> Silly doesn't so cool. to cut it. Wait, yet, as I... soon as I see she was coming in, I was like, oh, that's going to give him the boost. That's going to give him the boost. And he's going to kick his ass. It's like, yes. The very best choice Togashi could have ever made. The scope and emotional weight of these matchups continues to grow. And with each passing round and with each singular moment topping anything prior, I wait with bated breath as to what lies ahead of me here. Yusuke's training. In Battle Shonen, training sequences oh, yeah. or reprieves from battle have become a staple of the genre. A sort of prolonged period of struggle used to position the main character for an upcoming conflict in line with the themes of the story. Dragon Ball most notably has a great many training arcs, Naruto mm -hmm. too, heck, even Hunter Hunter has them. But what I found interesting about this particular one with Yu Yu Hakusho's is the timing of the training itself. There have been plenty of opportunities for Yusuke and his allies to train. We've even been told that this training has taken place, or at worst, it's been suggested at. But it always remained off screen. It almost suggests that these moments aren't important. However, nothing could be further from the truth. For a writer, the acts of including and excluding something are both creative choices. Choices that serve a specific 
purpose. We see Goku learn the spirit bomb on King Kai's planet, but nothing is shown of the Kaioken up until the moment it's Oh yeah, that's true battle. actually, yeah. It creates narrative mystique around it. All the while, with the spirit bomb, we understand it completely we and know. are aware of it in Goku's back yeah, pocket. Yeah, yeah. When the Kaioken appears, we're shocked. And when the last ditch spirit bomb is used, we feel the tension, well aware of how long it takes for Goku to build that monster up. What was seen and ultimately unseen was purposely weaved that way for surprise and tension. And Togashi has used that to great effect so far. We stepped into this tournament with no idea of what Yusuke learned off screen and that provided great payoff with awesome surprises. But now, Togashi gives the reader a direct view of the training for a very specific reason. This intense struggle Yusuke undertakes is important to witness both in terms of setup for future plot points and what it does thematically. The training itself is framed as the last test Genkai will ever give Yusuke, insinuating that either she won't be long for this world or Yusuke will simply have no need for her any longer. At any rate, she continues to talk about the natural order of things, how as you get older you gain wisdom and experience, but those years also rob you of your natural strength. Quote, nature gives us our time and then we step aside for the next generation. Yeah, you gotta fight. I, I like what she says later on as well. It's like um, Toguru gave up on the fight against life and just threw away everything else for it. And it's just like, oh. Nestled within this conversation, Togashi plants a single panel of Toguro during all of this, almost as if it were included by mistake. But then she asks Yusuke an important question. <laughs> Hmm. This is a test. A test to confirm something yet unknown to us as a reader, but for whatever reason, Genkai needs to know where Yusuke's true values lie. Would he really do anything for power? He says that he will, so Genkai tests that very theory, asking him to kill her. Yeah, I was just like, what's going on? But she's a clever girl, she's a clever girl. Suddenly, it starts to rain heavily, as if to mimic the storm of confusion whirling within Yusuke's mind. It's a dilemma with a clear outcome, but his moral compass prevents him from taking action. He's forced to contend with where he, as a human, draws that line. And as he crosses the threshold into the calm atmosphere of the cave out of the storm, suddenly it all becomes clear. This test wasn't trying to measure if Yusuke could follow through on a harrowing act in the name it's of the greater good. Yeah. It was a test to see if he was indeed a moral person. Yeah. Some because Togoro just threw it all the way. Someone deserving of Genkai's power. <laughs> May struggles through on this. Revealingly, in this circumstance, Yusuke was again presented with a dilemma. In order to accept this power, Yusuke needs to risk his life. According to Genkai, there's a high likelihood of a horrible death if you're not strong enough to accept this power. So naturally, Yusuke has two options here. To take it, or not. But he doesn't even hesitate. No, it's all. However, it's like, not let's go. nothing. You ah, know that in order to stand a chance floor. at competing against Togoro, he needs to get stronger. A lot stronger. He won't kill someone for that chance, but he will risk his own life because... Those he cares about are counting on him. And by far and away, my favorite aspect of this entire struggle Yusuke quietly endures in this cave is the consequence of the egg. Earlier in the tournament, Koenma Jr. makes an appearance in an all-new getup and hands Yusuke the very egg he was tasked to protect in the very first arc that he forgot about. This I thought it was a really nice throwback. I didn't forget about it. I was like, oh, cool. Egg feeds off of Yusuke's aura and will hatch into something depending on the content of Yusuke's character. And well, when it does hatch, it's this hilarious looking creature. However, lying there in the cave having collapsed in agony, Yusuke appears to be losing this internal fight. Maybe he can't accept this power. Maybe he's not the right person. He needs water. He's going to die. This was cute as anything, man. It was trying to hold it all. And, ah. Oh. For as silly as this thing looks, this is the living manifestation of all the good that Yusuke is and stands to offer the world. He arrives in the nick of time to offer aid, helping Yusuke make it to the other side of this in what little way it can. It's a wonderful metaphor that demonstrates that not only is Yusuke now ready for the next challenge, but Genkai didn't make a mistake by choosing him as her successor. What uplifts Yusuke isn't a self-serving desire, 
but instead a deep compulsion and need to protect others. A trait demonstrated through his action for his teammates, his desire to help that little creature Pooh, and of course, Keiko. Yusuke's come a long way since the first chapter of this story. I love how it's just so obvious between those two, but it's like, and I like that we got this little romance thing on the side. <sighs> and so this moment exists to make a point, a pivotal one, and one I'd like to save for the epic conclusion of this wonderful arc. Fractured Fairy Tales and Team Urameshi. With Yusuke's training underway, Togashi plays around with structure for the first time in this tournament. Throughout the aforementioned section, the battle between the rest of Team Urameshi and their current opponents, the Fractured Fairy oh, yeah. Tales, These is well underway, and Togashi cuts between the two plot points for a very specific reason. This matchup isn't really about some narrative within the battles themselves like everything up until this point has been. Instead, it exists to establish where everyone's power is at. Yeah, it's like they've all got stronger. How strong are they? He a obliterates his first opponent, then yeah, pulls off the most insane victory against the next, Mate. showcasing a flame-infused aura sword, a glimpse of just how deep his connection to the flame goes. Kurama's battle exhibits the most stunning of showcases, with his enemy using a reverse magic box, an item pulled from folklore that rewinds age on anyone affected by- Which, yep, yeah, totally works in his favour, which is just like, yo! It's smoky contents. Intent on taking Kurama back to a child in hopes of beating him then, instead it reverts him back to his terrifyingly powerful yes, box form. This was so of cool. Where he realizes he's doomed without mastery of this form. And yet, interestingly, we see little of Kuwabara, instead playing up his segment for jokes as the enemy repeatedly teleports him away from the battlefield. Instead of this, yeah. it shows Genkai effortlessly clear the battle. It had me questioning why Togashi was doing this beyond comedy, an answer I will soon find in the finale. And with the following segment revolving around a showcase of Togoro's team ruthlessly dispatching their opponents, I think it's pretty clear to see the contrast Togashi is trying to create here. This is where everyone stands. Mm -hmm. Their strengths, their weaknesses, the uncertainty of their trump cards, all set against a backdrop of Yusuke struggling harder than any of them to achieve his goal. But it's what occurs immediately after this, that really ties this all together and creates the most nail-biting tension possible going my into god. the climax. Here we go. Genkai versus oh. Togoro. Oh my god. It's difficult to downplay just how vital this segment is to the broader story. Oh. It's the convergence and coming together of two characters who played bit roles in prior arcs, now acting as the glue that elevates this from a very fun tournament to one I'll think about for many years to come. An ever-present mystery surrounding the masked fighter in this arc has been that of their identity, and the subversion that took place when she was initially revealed to be much younger looking during combat. Mm. In the hands of a lesser writer, this mystery would have remained just that, and no one would have minded. However, Togashi decided to leverage that very like, surprise no, I want into to a know. mechanism that ties everything thematically together with Togoro. In this arc, both Togoro and Genkai represent two opposing sides to a particular argument this arc is trying to resolve. Having trained in martial arts together as they grew up, a darkness brought on by the natural passage of time crept into Togoro's mind. Mm. All of that power he spent his life acquiring. He doesn't want to give it up. He doesn't want to stand aside for the next generation, choosing instead to sell his soul to the devil in order to retain his youthful demeanor and his strength, yeah, becoming the very monster that haunts Yusuke in this arc. As seen earlier, Genkai's powers are inextricably tied to her youthful appearance. Meaning, while she hands down her power for Yusuke to inherit, she is also openly communicating that it's not her youth that's valuable. It's the values Yusuke holds that are. There will always be need for good values. There will always be more youth to inherit it. It's not important for her to retain her power and her youth. Part of the circle of life is for the old and wise to hand down that wisdom the knowledge to the young to carry so forth. The that what we should encourage is kindness, not greed. This isn't how these sorts of stories go. Just mere seconds ago during the tournament, I spoke of how that entire segment was designed to give us an idea of where the gang is currently, to establish a narrative foothold from which we can launch into the finals on. For Genkai to die in her pupil's arms at this moment, while tragic, while serving to demonstrate how reprehensible and lost Togoro is, it also completely undoes all certainty going forward. Yeah. Which is perfect. Hey. 
The build up to this moment is solemn. What wound me up as well, just just to sorry throw tangent on this. It really, really wound me up that no one was telling Kuwabara what had happened with her, and it was just really pissing me off. But then, when it got to Kuwabara finding out during his fight, it's like, okay, I get it. Hiei struggles to match the power of Togoro despite his determination. Even through Ima's training, Kurama cannot even dream of besting Karasu. Yusuke sits in the aftermath of Genkai's death, staring at the cave his master set him upon. It's a series of stark and depressing moments that emphasize the feeling of all hope being lost so incredibly well. But I think where Togashi in his later years Yo, might have left this so hopelessness to linger, he's careful in instilling a sense of hope on this occasion. A contestant from the prior round reveals a history with Togoro and hands Kurama and Kuwabara two items to aid in their battle. A potion form of what restored Kurama's fox powers and a magical hilt for Kuwabara said to unleash a blade modeled on the nature of the one who wields it. And while these are physical manifestations of hope to turn the tides, it's Koenma's delivery of Genkai's final message that reignites Yusuke's own hope. Don't cross over, just okay. win. Oh, this was nice, this, like, do you reckon she, do you reckon he got there? It's like, oh. <sighs> this powerful response is a culmination of these moments. A message to Togoro and his gang that they will not be beaten down by tragedy. Instead, this is the spark that will ignite a fire under them and lead them to victory. Let's go! Team Urameshi versus Team Let's Togoro. go! These battles kick off with so much energy. Yeah, with Karasu and Kurama taking to the arena first, it's a brutal display and one of nail-biting intensity. Togashi drops a detail that the ingestible version of the fox form restoration magic takes a while to kick in, and so this battle is one long waiting game. And boy oh boy, when it finally does kick in, the imagery is incredible. And oh, that looks so good. The art and the manga is so Yet, good. Somehow this doesn't bring about victory. At now, oh, you see what wound me up about this character's design. I'm trying to see if it is in the manga. The anime, for some reason, you know, how, like Togoro's got the glasses. His little mask thing had a tiny thing that looked like the glasses. And I was like, why? And then I thought, like, you know, maybe I'm being stupid, but, like, yeah, in the, in the anime, he's got, like, a little glasses thing on the top. Unexpected. Karasu's own trick up his sleeve is equally as impressive, and with Kurama seemingly knocked out of his own fox form, Togashi has ramped up the tension to all new heights. This is all in service of creating a moment I wasn't convinced by at first. With Kurama out of all options, he's all forced to use a that move bad. that will end his own life. And he does just that. He uses everything he has to summon a devastatingly powerful blow against Karasu and wins. Except he doesn't die. Potion's effects, in fact, return him to his human body. A reunification of Kurama's human form and the fox spirit. At first, I can't say I love this. It seemed to me like a sudden and convenient victory, but mm. upon closer inspection, it dawned on me that this was earned. This was a full circle moment once a fox spirit who gave up his power reluctantly accepting humanity to survive, now willing to give up his life for others and rewarded with the restoration of his fox demon self. And Hiei's battle against Bui is ultimately no different. With Kurama deemed the loser due to some nonsensical technicality, Hiei puts himself forward to take on this brute despite aspirations to fight Togoro. He yields this right to Yusuke. For Genkai's sake, he says. This change in Hiei is hardly a new one. We've seen this through his actions in this arc already, but to hear it voiced is a powerful moment. Hiei has been characterized through selfishness and a desire to dominate. His very own technique was understood to be about mastery over demonic fire, the Black Dragon. Time and time again he failed, almost losing his arm in the process, but here, here he masters it. Not through domination, but through acceptance. In some respects, him and the Black Dragon become one, and it's that enhancement from within that leads to victory. It's a stunning moment of poetry and a real high point for this. So tournament. sick. 
Perhaps more than anyone, it's Kuwabara's match that feels the most overt in its conveyance of character work. The elder Toguro morphs into versions of Genkai, mocking not just her death, but Kuwabara's inability to understand the reality of her absence in this round. Yeah, oh, this is how he finds out, and it? it's like, what? And then he gets wound up, like, why did anyone tell me? This entire battle is a test of character, of perseverance and hardiness in the face of adversity. And despite Kuwabara's presence always on the lighter side of things in this tournament, there's an intentional and uncharacteristic gravitas to this victory that really spoke to me. Not in the act itself, but the aftermath. Kuwabara <laughs> berates and rages at Yusuke for not telling him about <laughs> Genkai. God, and excuse me. Yusuke wistfully recounts his reasoning, Kuwabara turns away. And in one of the most stunning panels of this chapter, he says only two words. Beat him. With those powerful words echoing through his mind, Yusuke is now ready and steps up to face... Toguro. Let's go. Yo. Let's go. Let's go. Yes, you sky flies Toguro. This oh, is, God. without a doubt, <laughs> one of the greatest battles I've ever seen illustrated. This is so Jumping good. up to 80% from the start, Togashi illustrates Toguro with the most insane brushwork I've ever wow. seen. This man is a hulking monstrosity that physically oh. looms over Yusuke from page to page. The speed from panel to panel is honestly startling. And as things ramp up, Togashi falls back on looser shapes to contrast Toguro's terrifying agility in contrast to robust illustrative close-ups oh found elsewhere. And that's not even mentioning the way this battle is choreographed. There are upside-down ray guns, arena-destroying blasts, and oh my god, it has the classic I was holding back all this oh, time moment when so Yusuke cool. drops his aura. Like, ah, oh, let's go. This is battle shonen beauty. Toguro's jump to his 100% form is just insane. Look at these pages. So grotesque. Look at them. It is pure, unadulterated talent from Togashi spinning that out looks of every amazing. single panel. And what's more is, my man Togro blocks a blast with a single shout before uttering the coldest line I've ever read. I love this. I love this. I, still, I almost oh, lost wow. my damn mind when he seemingly took out Kuwabara. Yeah. The result what the hell, man? It's like, I'm just going to kill your mate now. I want you to get that power boost. I want you to do Goku Super Saiyan moments. The <laughs> moments are so beyond breathtaking. This is genuine battle shown in perfection. And yet, in spite of all this stunning spectacle, this is only a tiny fraction of why I adore this fight. <laughs> During my reviews, I often feel compelled to delve into the past of the artists behind the stories I'm covering, hoping to get a snapshot into the mind and soul that's invited me into his world through his stories. However, during my coverage of Hunter x Hunter, Yoshihiro Togashi intimidated me. Or rather, his approach to manga creation did. You gotta remember, because this is my job and I set myself a reading goal every week to hit, when I cover a new story, I effectively throw myself into that world entirely, day after day, until it's done. Hmm. And chapter after chapter, and arc after arc, as the weeks ticked on by, I could feel the thin veil of happiness and joy that informed Hunter x Hunter's early chapters slowly give way and reveal the true bedrock of that story. Hmm. The complicated, emotional distress of its creator permeated every page, every pen stroke, every single word. To say that it caused me distress by the finish would be an understatement. When you hang around negativity all day, you start to feel the same way. And in an effort to prevent that from happening further to myself, I stopped looking into Togashi altogether. So much so that had it not been for the comments under those very reviews, I would never have known that there was a series called Yu Yu Hakusho associated with him in the first place. <laughs> However, I fixed that during my coverage of this arc. As I noted last week, in the same way that I could see how much Yu Yu Hakusho had influenced or set the groundwork for Hunter x Hunter, this week I can see just how much Togashi's earlier work, Tende Shoaru Cupid, influenced this magnificent series Yu Yu Hakusho and indeed the final matchup with Togoro oh, himself. Okay. Tende Shoaru Cupid is a four volume romance manga chronicling the life of a young boy and a devil girl. That description feels totally analogous to what Togashi is known for nowadays, however, the fingerprints of that subtle appreciation 
appreciation for the human condition and emotion have always lingered long after the series concluded. It's no secret that accepting a surface level observation as a reader of Togashi's stories betrays uh, an ignorance of the beauty his work stands to offer. Informing every seemingly lighthearted action in Hunter x Hunter is a quiet sadness and underneath every uplifting crescendo in Yu Yu Hakusho is a peaceful serenity and appreciation for the finer details. To a passive observer, Yusuke vs Toguro is simply a story's hero overcoming the crude brute in the name of what is right, and there's certainly some truth to that. But like I said moments earlier, accepting just that as the substance of this story betrays an ignorance of what Yoshihiro Togashi is capable of giving you. I've seen a few folks online describe this arc as aimless or lacking in substance, and when you consider that there's a looming threat revealed moments before the final that we haven't been privy to through Mr. Sakyo, I can sort of understand how some people might feel that way about it. However, for me, I honestly felt that it was not only a phenomenally well-written and well-conceived of ending, but it was in fact one of the most effectively uplifting endings in an arc I've read ever. And what's more is, the other fights surrounding it and building up to this clash echo the sentiments contained therein. In one way or another, these individual fights speak to a choice or some element of Team Urameshi's past. Kurama vs Karasu and Hiei vs Bui both feature our heroes contending with the choices or circumstances of their past, both displayed in very different ways resulting in very different outcomes. A former fox spirit struggling to reignite the power that once defined him, forced to rely on his own selfless and sacrificial nature to make up the difference, and a demon once shackled by a desperate gambit now having mastered the unthinkable, culminating in one of the most satisfying conclusions to any of the fights except for one. Yusuke versus Togoro. Let's go. Our true main event and the climax of not it. just Come this arc, <laughs> but the manga up until this point. This fight is a masterpiece, and I don't throw that word around lightly. Masterpieces in Battle Shonen are sort of rare by design. They are often the culmination of everything concerning the themes, story, and participants involved up until that point in the manga. Everything converges in one perfectly powerful point, leaving everything on the page with nothing held back. Only a few fights come to mind when I consider this criteria. Goku vs Vegeta is an obvious one. The proud Saiyan elite versus the lower class commoner. And in the end, it's what made Goku who he was that ultimately made the difference in that clash of ideologies. This is all to say, of course, that for a masterpiece of Battle Shonen to be considered such, it needs to say something more than just the fighting itself. Something about the characters, the themes, and on some level, has to create a powerful and resonant connection between itself and us reading along. Yusuke vs Togoro is that masterpiece. Mechanically speaking, how these two characters and their personalities are designed and complement each other lends itself poetically in some ways to what Togashi is trying to achieve with this final battle. Consider this, the inciting incident that launches this story into full swing is a single choice Yusuke makes. A choice to save a small child from being hit by a My car. car yeah. He didn't need to do this, but who he is forced him to act. This paired with his loud, crass, bad boy demeanor, and you've got for yourself someone who feels very much like an active character within his story. One that dictates where it goes and drives it forward. And then he meets Togoro, Togoro. at the end of the last arc. I'm not talking about this meeting, I'm talking really meeting the real Togoro when he challenges him to the tournament proper. Yusuke is abjectly terrified, triggering a fear response and urgency within him that pushes him to seek out Genkai for more strength, more power. And as the arc begins, we see he's achieved just that. There's something totally different about Yusuke in this moment. He's different. He's changed. And this fact is tangibly tackled at two separate instances during the story itself. I'll touch on the most obvious first. So, this is one of the most pivotal moments in the arc's second half. One that plays into the finish beautifully and one that serves to reaffirm for us who Yusuke is. And this is important because that's actually a massive part of this manga story and most importantly, the climax itself. Unable to accept who he is, what he is, Togoro rejects the natural order of things, rejecting the person that he is in favor of gaining everything he desires. Power. And lots of it. In the pursuit of eternal youth and this great selfish power, 
He's forced to relinquish his own humanity, his allies, himself in the process. This, we later learn, is what Genkai is testing Yusuke with by- Yeah, because she doesn't want him to turn out like Togaro. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's why she's testing him the way he's testing him. him. to kill her. It's his final test. Having rushed to her side, driven by fear following Togaro's challenge, Yusuke, much like Togaro, has been driven by a desire to get stronger. But will he do anything to get stronger? No. Not anything. In a moment of utter dialogue poetry, Togashi pens a response so perfect for Yusuke's character to utter, it both made me laugh and gave me chills all at once. In response to her request to kill her, he simply says, I'm gonna have to fail this test. It won't be the last. It won't be the first. Chef's kiss. And through choosing this path, Yusuke proves that he's indeed the right person to inherit Genkai's energy. But I digress. Why bring this up at all? Well, from the get-go, I sort of saw Togoro as what Yusuke could have been if he were morally bankrupt enough yeah, or desperate definitely. enough to allow his darkest desires to dictate who he was. And in the end, it was that comparison that was made between the two and the differences that were emphasized that made their final fight as compelling as it ultimately was for me. But I was only half right in my estimation, because I actually totally misread what sort of character Yusuke was. In the closing moments of the fight, Togoro taunts Yusuke by insinuating that he is similar to himself. And I could almost see that being the case. They both appear to be active and abrasive characters willing to push for strength to achieve their goals. However, there was a fundamental difference at play here. One that I didn't fully appreciate until the very end, because Yusuke, isn't an active character at all. The group of Botan, Yusuke's mom, and Keiko flounder around a lot in this arc, with their main purpose being a cheers section for Togashi to cut to and- it's always, They're always fun as well, and her little love interest with the, the bad guy dude was interesting, and then- In order yeah. to add some variety to the commentary on each fight they view. But there is one vital piece of story offered by Keiko when she arrives at the tournament grounds. She says that she doesn't want to stop Yusuke from participating, despite her desire for him to be safe, because Ooh. he looks like he's happy. happy yeah. It's a blink and you miss it moment, but it speaks to the core of Yusuke, I think, quite profoundly. Despite being surrounded by monsters, Yusuke only has eyes for his friend's safety. For the first time in his life, he feels as though he has a purpose, which, if you cast your minds back, stands in stark contrast to how he was depicted in the very first chapter, where he, in a sort of apathetic way, didn't see the urgency or need to even come back to life at all. His opinion on what he offered the world had been molded by the teachers, fellow students, and other kids in his life, telling him consistently that he was nothing more than a bad kid, yeah, a, a torment, and yeah. drain on society. But in this group of misfits, he's found a place that not only he can do well in, but in fact contribute good to also. And so, in what I had initially thought was a clash of two individuals with similar motivations valuing different things, in the end, it actually amounted to a coming together of two polar opposite forces. And this is reflected in the art direction of the fight too, where Togoro is penned in this sharp, vicious, and almost uncomfortable detail countless times over. Yusuke is the embodiment of tranquility, like Togoro is a hurricane and Yusuke the eye of that hurricane. During this battle, it's revealed that Togoro, the man who sold his soul for his own selfish desires, actually does have some minor redemption in the end. A doubt, or guilt rather, that's informed his actions. Yeah, like, doesn't, don't we find out that, like, uh, his whole clan were killed by yokai, and that's why he, like, he did what he did, and then it's like, whoa. His pursuit of someone stronger enough to give him what he thinks he deserves. And the boy who once had nothing to live for, who was convinced he was a waste of space, finally found his reason to live. Not just for others, but for himself also. He found where he belongs. He was never a bad kid, he was always a misunderstood hero who would sooner throw his own life into the line of fire than to risk anyone else's. Mm. The climax of this fight isn't a full circle moment for either character, it's a realization and acceptance of who they each are, and there's something remarkably poignant about that. And so, in the same way that those in Yusuke's life took him at face value and misjudged him, characterizing him as nothing more than a bad kid, so too does Yoshihiro Togashi's magnificent dark tournament arc offer a subtly sophisticated story, rich with heart, waiting to be appreciated. You just have to be open to seeing it. <laughs>
In conclusion, the epilogue to this arc is one of redemption. One characterized by a brief conversation between Togoro and Genkai in the afterlife. A moment that solidifies the themes of this arc and offers a heart-wrenching final word from Togoro. Quote, Sorry to have been so much trouble. It's a beautiful bow on this gift of an arc, yes. and a moment that truly solidified my feelings towards this tournament. My only understanding going into this story was that this arc was considered a masterpiece of the genre, and as I write this on the other side of having experienced it, I can confidently say Togashi lived up to and surpassed those very expectations on every conceivable level. But I can't help but look at this story and comparisons made by its fans to other tournaments within the medium without feeling like they're missing the forest for the trees. Dragon Ball's Tenkaichi Budokai, My Hero Academia's sports festival arc, countless tournaments exist in Battle Shonen, but they all have such unique tonality and aims that I find the comparisons odd, superficial even. The equivalent of comparing Wally and Aliens simply because they're both set in space. space right, yeah, yeah. Yu Yu Hakusho's <laughs> Dark Tournament was every bit the arc that was promised and then some. It's a sophisticated and elegant execution of a classic tournament archetype that oozes with the flashes of greatness that made Hunter x Hunter a household name. It's a masterpiece of battle shown in storytelling, a compelling character study and boasted more incredible artwork than I've ever seen from Togashi on such a consistent basis. But I wonder. Does its emphasis on character complexity make it inherently superior to works less interested in such an approach? Or is it just different? As I prepare for the final stretch of this magnificent story, I'd be curious to hear what you think in that regard. Yu Yu Hakusho is incredible, it's and I will great. see you all next time for the thrilling conclusion to this incredible story. Excuse me. Great review, great review. And um, yeah, I, I I enjoyed it, man. It's like yeah, the anime is boss, but it's nice to see like the artwork and stuff like from the from the manga thrown out like that. And then, yeah, um, it didn't touch on the fact that um, oh, what's her name? She gets brought back, doesn't she? At the end, what's Thingy's wish? Which I thought was quite cool. Um, but yeah, I've noticed quite a few. Things that make me think that JJK have referenced it and stuff, and uh, this new, new, I'll mention it in the next review. The things that these bad guys are doing is definitely inspired uh, one of the coolest things in JJK. But uh, I'll talk about that next time. Thank you to my patrons. If you want to have your name at the end of every video I upload, link, link is in the description to the Patreon page. One dollar a month is the last push. I was greatly appreciate that guys for that. Thank you all. Too bitching. What do you guys think of that? What do you guys think of this? Click like, subscribe if you haven't already. Leave comments below. Let me know what I should watch or discuss in future videos. I'll see you guys, all you guys, next time.